Hi, and welcome to another episode of About the Authors TV. I'm your host, Jake Brown. One of the edgiest novelists writing in the world of fiction today, the Huffington Post once ran a headline to that effect, declaring the author in question the indomitable Taryn Fisher, who because of her fearlessness on the page, has a fan base that is loyal and passionate and awaits each new release with zeal. Beginning over a decade ago with her first novel, The Opportunist, was published, and continuing onward with successful early follow-ups like Dirty Red, Thief, Mudvayne, Never Never, co-written with Colleen Hoover, Marrow, Love, Bad Mommy, Atheists Who Kneel and Pray, Folsom, Jackal, Marriage, The Wives, where USA Today, who in a broader coverage of the author's one-of-a-kind style, wrote the New York Times best-selling author, Taryn Fisher, writes in a way that confounds and entrances us in an utterly unique way, promising here that fans will revel in Fisher's story. Like the score of a film, it builds to an emotional and psychological crescendo that will keep readers on their toes until its final page. The Wrong Family and her more recent releases, An Honest Lie, were publishers weekly muse that as fans of thriller author Taryn Fisher know, nothing is off the table in her stories of resilient women, nuanced villains, and page-turning twists, and Good Half Gone, and she's here today to talk about it all. Taryn, welcome to the show. Now, is it safe to assume that you, as they say, were born telling stories? And what sorts could we have found you reading growing up that helped shape your style as a storyteller? I was actually born and raised in South Africa, Johannesburg, South Africa. So we got everything because of apartheid about eight years later than America got it. So I feel like I did grow up in the same era as you because I was seeing all of those movies as they were brand new to me, but in 1989. Um, so I was reading Stephen King. I was very horror focused as a youth. And I think that was part of the 80s. The satanic panic was part of our daily lives back then. And um, <laughs> yeah, I wanted to write horror and fantasy initially. And I was really bad at it. And so I thought, well, why don't you write romance? Because you're really good at kind of screwing up relationships. So that's how I started writing romance. I brought like horror and villains into love stories. And that's the 80s. You definitely have a style that's all your own, that's for sure. Any academics who recognized that early on and began encouraging you down that path? Oh yes, I had several female English teachers that knew I had a love of reading and they started saying, I think you should start writing. And I did. And so I still have these notebooks that I was writing full length novels when I was eight, nine, 10, 11, because my teachers were encouraging that. Now, one of them, her name was Mrs. Cock, and the other one was Mrs. Garen. <laughs> we don't often quote from Goodreads, but in a review of your first published book, The Opportunist, they really nailed this formula you found within writing your own style of romance, where Taryn Fisher's a master of words and a genius at manipulating the emotions of her readers. How did Olivia Caspin reflect that on the page as you first began writing this first entree in the Love Me With Lies series? I just was begrudgingly, begrudgingly trying my hand at romance. And I didn't know that romance had to have a happy ending because I didn't read it. I had no clue that it sort of came with that HEA tag. And I did not do that in my indie romance. And so people would say, this isn't a real romance this tragic, this is so sad. And that is almost what brought my specific crowd of readers that I still have to this day. They have a, a taste for sad romance, tragic romance. I don't know what you would call it. So I brought a, a different avenue. Everybody else was starting with the, the happy romances and I kind of threw in an extra seasoning. And I didn't do as well as the happily ever after crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Sticking to your instincts would seem key when you're first cultivating a readership, for sure. How early do you feel like you further refine that style and connection with your readers over sequels, Dirty Red and Thief? Well, I love Dirty Red because she's the absolute villain and no one wanted to hear from her. And so I was, again, I could have gone the money route and done something smart with the next book I wrote. But instead, I was like, I'm going to force you to get into the head of the character you dislike most. And I, I earned a lot of uh, loyalty from readers that way, but then a lot of people walked away and they were like, we hate you, we hate your style. <laughs> that series 
created its own cult of readers, and then I deviated again with Mudvayne. The USA Today, a career-long fan, took early note of the fact, only four books in, that the buzz on this one is spread early and quickly. It was the it book we all eagerly anticipated, pined over, waited for. What we learned from her Love Me With Lies series is that she doesn't give us hearts and rainbows. She gives us reality, secrets, lies, and just maybe a little bit of love in the mix. In Mudbane, she gives us all of that enveloped in a whole lot of mystery and suspense. From the very beginning, I was completely captivated by the story. A story about truth. The truth we seek to uncover. The truth we bury inside so no one else can see. And finally, the truth we find, oftentimes too late. Is it safe to assume this work bloomed again out of your own personal roots? And what USA Today concluded was a masterclass in whodunit suspense that kept me furiously flipping the pages. But it was the writing, the characters, and the emotion, the story inside it, that left them shocked and breathless by its poignant end. I was going through a divorce, and so I wrote an allegory about my sadness, which was so depressing. And so then I earned this new group of readers that didn't necessarily like the series, but loved this new depression, depressing version of Taryn. So I've kind of jumped around with my own feelings. I'm writing fiction based on whatever I'm going through. So I have books all over the place. One day we're sure you'll get there with your own original twist, no doubt, which is already spinning as a wind at your back and that of your best friend and co-author, Colleen Hoover, on what became Never Never, a bestseller for both of you. When did you two first decide to team up on what Book Tribune, reflecting a fan fervor already in the air heading into its release? Brave was an irresistible collaboration between best-selling TikTok sensation Hoover and acclaimed thriller author Taryn Fisher. You simply can't go wrong with two best-selling authors of suspense writing in tandem. We were still shocked at how seamless, fluid, and gripping Never Never is. Both Hoover and Fisher bring the very best of their own books and seemingly encourage one another to reach even greater heights. Hoover pens her trademark romantic suspense, will they or won't they scenes, and Fisher adds her own talents for domestic thrillers to create a work that succeeds on its own in both genres. This twisty, unique novel is full of intrigue that simply won't let up, a premise that grips you from the first scene, and a love story that feels both universal and deeply intimate. Colleen is my best friend and she is an endless fountain of ideas. And so she's constantly telling me her book ideas and then she doesn't write them and I get angry because I'm like, you said you were gonna write me this book. So she told me the idea for Never Never and then she just forgot about it and I kept poking at her. So eventually I wrote the first chapter and I sent it to her and I said, keep going. So then she wrote a chapter and sent it back and she tried to write me into a corner. So then I took that as a challenge and I wrote the next one and sent it back to her. And so it really just was a best friend, <laughs> long texting situation. <laughs> a lot of it, we were texting back and forth, texting an email, and it just went from there into a book. Now, everyone loves a good vigilante when they're bringing justice to those who escape it legally. And what a cool character Margot Moon is in this tradition. Did you see a real-life news story that sent you out seeking revenge for victims on the page in Merrill? No. I Again, I was angry. Now my divorce is over. And now I'm just looking at the world through this new lens. And I was watching a Viking TV show. It was a commercial for it. And... This Viking woman has a basket of food and she's serving her family. And all of a sudden she just throws it to the side and pulls out a sword instead. And I was like, yes, yes. And I started writing this angry serial killer book because I wanted to kill everyone, but I wasn't allowed. And so it was just me taking out everything I hated. And that is the strangest book I've ever written. So I think the setting was my soul. <laughs> <laughs> and a really depressing town in Washington. Popular blog, Must Read Books or Die, had the same evocative reaction to f love as most anyone whose eyes crossed paths with its daring title and began reading out of sheer curiosity. That this one really hit right to the heart. The words that Taryn writes are always special and the voice of her characters is so unique, but so effortless to read that it just flows right off the page and absorbs into our skin. Hell and Kitten Company are no different, and thank you, Lord, we started the year off with this book. How visual does the storytelling process become for you as you're crafting a work like this that inspired this blogger to conclude, I cannot wait to read this novel again? I started dating a guy when I was writing Mero, and then the next book I wrote was Fuck Love, so then you clearly know how that first post-marriage relationship went. Um, 
And I really don't care. I'm an artist. I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm here to make my art and then I'm going to die. So do whatever. I don't actually see the story, any part of the story in my imagination. I, I didn't realize until recently that people read books and saw the whole thing. I don't. I, and I don't want to. I just hear the story. And so... Again, it's me when I'm writing the character. I'm I'm immersed because that I'm writing about a portion of my soul that's happening at that moment. So I don't even have to try to be the character because I already am. Um, so yeah, they're just really my books are very honest. I never try to publish under a pen name. This is all Taryn Fisher laid bare, and I enjoy it. Your fans love you for it. And the Huffington Post would spotlight within their coverage of your next novel, Bad Mommy, that there are so many underlying tropes and leap motifs, some that run continually through the entire oeuvre. We see the doppelganger, the foil, the alter ego, the Freudian parts of the psyche, schadenfreude, the villain, especially the female antagonist, motherhood, heartbreak and betrayal, and the trickster. In this novel, many of these archetypes are amplified and then filtered through the lens of social media. And we love the three-act structure of the psychopath, the sociopath, and the writer. Why did you feel it made the most sense organizationally to set the book up this way? I've blocked a lot of writing bad mommy out of my mind. Um, but I, yes, you do as well. Um, I distinctly remember being the writer and I was observing the other two and writing out my experience of what I saw and heard. Uh, that was that was a very fun and painful book to write. You know, again, the fallout of F Love, then comes <laughs> what happened next. Atheists who kneel and praise a song title I would have loved to have stolen if it wasn't emblazoned on the cover of this book already. Did you get any pushback on this title from the publisher? As it's a clever turn of phrase that could lead a reader in several directions interpretively. Part of the fun for sure when you can get away with a cool one like this. When I was writing these books, there were a lot of romantic musician books that were coming out. So I said, I'm never going to do that. I What do I even know? And then I dated a musician and he was a drummer. So then I felt like I had to, I wanted to explore writing about falling in love with a musician. And I thought that was a very clever title. I was very proud of myself for coming up with that. But readers think it is a religious book. They do not know it is a fictional love story. So I don't know if that was an overly indulgent choice or if it was a brilliant choice, but you know, we're living with it. <laughs> it's atheists who kneel and pray. The Pacific Northwest provides such a naturally moody backdrop to draw from in terms of atmosphere, and readers once again return here to Port Townsend. Is this based on a real town you lived in that then proved irresistible to fictionalize and marriage and other stories in which it's been an affecting co-star? This was just, um, I was just flowing with what I was feeling, and I don't know if you've opened the title page of F Love, but if you see who the book is dedicated to, I also said, for my haters, fuck you. So it was just stemming off of this rebellious moment I had with F Love. And I mean, my kids go to private Christian schools. So I've always had to look, you know, a lot of people in the face. Oh, you're a writer. I didn't do a pen name. So there just have been mass Christian ladies that have gone to look up my book titles. But I like to be judged. I enjoy it. Um, I don't think it's a quality a lot of women enjoy, but I do because I'm a surprise. Most people are surprised when they get to know me. So I do the same thing with my titles and my book covers. Like it's you're going to be my type of person if you see through it and you swing my way. And if you judge me immediately, I don't really want you there. So it's kind of a way to weed towards weed out the people I don't want. I can't write in the summer. It's too happy and bright. So I live in Washington state because I really milk the weather out here for creative purposes. And then there's three and a half months here of no rain, beautiful, bright, sunny weather. And I hide in my office. I pull the shades down and I put rain sounds on to try to work and simulate <laughs> 
the gloom. Publishers Weekly went crazy about the wives, like so many readers who were drawn in. By Thursday, an unreliable narrator of this engrossing psychological thriller, who the explained tries to be the perfect wife for Seth, her perfect husband. The only problem is her awareness and seeming acceptance of sharing Seth with two other wives who live in another city. Fisher smoothly inserts moments of self-doubt, longing, paranoia, and triumph into her unsettling narrative as she draws the reader into Thursday's conflicted and increasingly complicated life, before concluding that suspense fans will be rewarded. Would you use characters like Thursday and Hannah, or even the slimy Seth, to explore a bit with viewers about how you immerse yourself inside each's mind as you spend time with them on the page individually and then collectively as this story seems to just storm forward? I get to know them as I'm writing, but I did have a degree in psychology and theology. So, I mean, you get to study a lot of aspects of a person, their mind and their spirit. And usually there'll be a person who's just passed through my life like a Seth. And um, I'm like, oh, if you come into my life and you cause some type of suffering for me or drama, I'm going to monetize it. So, I mean, if I meet you, you're interesting, you cause me some pain, I'm going to repurpose this in my life. So, yeah, I've, I would have known a Seth. That. I immerse in the character. I do take on the role. I was writing The Wives and it's about polygamy. And I was pregnant while I was writing The Wives. And I watched a television show called The Glitch. And it's about a woman who comes back from the dead and her husband married her best friend. And I was, was so angry about this show. I kept saying to my husband, what would you do? What would you do if I died and came back and you were married to someone else and she's pregnant? And he was like, well, can I just take care of both of you? Oh my gosh, wrong answer. It drove me to write this book about polygamy because I was so rageful about what my husband do if I came back to life after dying. <laughs> so, I mean, I was mad at him the whole time and I was having dreams about him bringing home new wives and they've got these pregnancy hormones. So I just leaned in. Again, if I'm going to suffer, we're going to find a way to incorporate this into my career. So yeah, I lean into whatever it is to get really dark and gloomy. And the only people I protect from that are my children. But my husband is fair game. Like, you're going to get it. You married me. Tough luck. Book Reporter would caution within their stellar review of The Wrong Family that Fisher notes in her acknowledgments that part of her story is based on a factual occurrence, before adding that we cannot stress enough how marvelous the author is as subtle misdirection, hints and sleight of hand. The characters lie to each other and to themselves, so that the truth is something that rises to the top of the book slowly, if at all. What made you want to blow a tornado through suburbia, so to speak here, ultimately does about these seemingly on-the-surface perfect relationships. I wrote that book during the pandemic, and that book is about being confined and hiding. So all of my female relationships were kind of imploding and getting heated too. Everybody was arguing during the pandemic. So I was actively observing certain fallouts and personalities mismatch. And I mean, I've never lived inside of a male brain. I don't know how you process, but I'm constantly watching how women treat each other and how we process one another. And I'm just writing about what I see. I don't necessarily agree with it or like it, but this is what we do. And Winnie and Juno are just, they were two characters I didn't quite enjoy spending the pandemic with. They got on my nerves. I hated both of them, but I'm often compelled to tell stories about people I don't like. They're more interesting than the people I do like. I love the villain. That I still don't like them when you bring up their names. I'm like, ugh. That must mean you did your job as creator. It's like the actor we hate after watching them in a movie, playing an antagonist because they did such a convincing job. Any advice for the aspiring author trying to find their way into doing so with this character type with the same success you have booking and out? Channeling your personal agitation about the world into one character and then just spending so much time with them and you're gonna come up with something interesting. And just being mad at them all the time. Like I, I think I'm a very salty person because I'm always walking around with these annoying voices in my head. But I think they come to people who are willing to tell their stories. I don't know why I like crazy people. 
Mystery and Suspense magazine declared at the top of their review of An Honest Lie that Taryn Fisher knows how to write suspense. This novel is told via alternating timelines, then and now, with Rainey narrating. Her narration of then is about growing up in a cult and how it formed who she is now. Both timelines are equally fascinating, as cults can often be from the outside looking in. But upon much closer examination, they usually reveal more disturbing details. What fascinated you about creating a character like Torrid and his friendship Arizona-based quote-unquote family, who all live together in an abandoned prison that no one ever quite escapes from, we discover, even after Rainey does? I was house shopping again during the middle of the pandemic, and um, she, my realtor took me to the top of Tiger Mountain to see this house, and it was at the top of the whole mountain. It was a black house, and it just had this whole vibe. And yeah, I went to see the house, and I was like, well, I'm going to write the next book from this house. There was even a sign in the front that said End of Road. So initially, the book was going to be called End of Road. It just starts from me going into a place and wanting to buy it. <laughs> I do write in location, um, but I used to go into the town where the house was, you know, the bottom of the mountain and right there and watch the wives because they were coming into the coffee shops, the ladies who lived on the mountain that I was, you know, imagining. Crime Spree magazine was instantly riveted upon opening Good Half Gone and meeting Iris, whose identical twin sister Piper was kidnapped when they were teenagers. And Piper's about to commence work as an intern in the Shoal Island Hospital for the Criminally Insane, where she believes she'll find answers to her sister's disappearance all those years ago. And the story alternates here between Iris's perspective as a teenager, around the time Piper was kidnapped from a movie theater, and Iris in the present day. We all love a twisty thriller with alternating perspectives, and this one was entertaining to read. What creative motivation was driving you while writing this latest bestseller? I was raised by a feminist father. Um, he from the oh, I, he was like a cult leader, feminist father. But when I was about six years old, he would start saying to me, "Men are bastard pigs. Do not trust men." women are superior. And so I very much took that to heart. And I've always written books for women about women's issues. So all of these issues are things that I get very angry about in my real life that I'm ranting about in my home life. And so those situations are going to always find their way into my books. There's going to be a way that a woman suffers and how women treat each other and make each other suffer and the consequence. And I, I mean, I'm writing what I find meaningful. I wanted to write about um, not only how society breaks the sibling relationship, but also breaks a woman's spirit and the different things that sort of attack a woman as she's developing from girlhood into womanhood, how that affects your perspective when you're choosing a partner, when you're choosing a job. And so all of these issues are sort of wrapped up in this mystery story of where is my twin sister? Who took her? Why did they take her? What am I going to do about it? This is just the hospital that I would imagine um, that came out of my need for a dark and gloomy book. I do not like beach reads. I don't want to be in the sun. I always want to be reading about dark, gloomy places. So I did work in psychology and I was a caseworker. And so I'm sort of channeling the hopelessness of how some of these places felt when I worked there with the Washington, the typical Washington setting. Well, I decided not to work in that field because I did not want my perspective on people to change. I didn't want to get that hopeless or burned out or view people in that light. So, um, I mean, I chose an entirely different field, but when I write about it, it's very um, factual about what I saw. You can't possibly know the heart of these people or the minds of, of what the mentally ill are going through. So I try not to talk about um, anything other than the personality that they would show you and the, the same dignity you would give a relative or somebody that you love that was in this position, which my dad was. Um, and my dad was mentally ill, but also so funny and intelligent and had the richest personality. So 
I want to always keep the dignity and love fresh in my heart. And that's how I sort of view all of it. In giving fans a look at what's coming up, where's your creative compass been pointing you lately? Well, I've done four thrillers with my publisher and I want to break. So I'm going back to romance, which I said I never would. <laughs> but I'm ready to like murder hearts and make people super depressed again. I'm very good at that. So the next step is probably a, another romance trilogy. Finally, with a fan base like yours, the Huffington Post describes as loyal and passionate and awaiting each new release with zeal. When you meet those readers standing in line at book signings, what's the connection like personally you feel when you're in the presence of the power of that long-term loyalty that you've built over the years with your reading audience? Every, I do a lot of book signings. I do a lot of traveling and they do come out everywhere I go to support me. And we've all been in a community online for years together and there's thousands of us, but we know each other. Um, we're very comfortable all being honest and villains. We call the, the 21 Pilots song Heathens is our theme song. And um, they're very protective of me. So I've gone through these horrible things in my life and I've had to go to a book signing in Canada and people will, you know, drive in in droves. And I'll be surrounded by, you know, dozens of these women. So it's, that's the most rewarding part is I love women first and foremost, and my ability to, connect to them through the stories is what brings me the most joy. Writing comes secondary to these um, connections that I'm having with, with other women. And I am a bold woman and I do feel like I have a lot of the confidence things figured out. So I want to share it, whether it's in stories or if I get to look one of my readers in the eye and, you know, she tells me how it impacted her. I mean, that's why I'm here. What else am I doing here? Earth kind of sucks in general. So the fact that I get to write and make a difference and shop as much as I do. I'm just having fun. Taryn, it's been wonderful talking today. Thanks so much for taking our time to be on About the Authors TV. Thank you.